starts talking this track. So Chris, Chris Saxon, Oracle Developer Advocate for SQL, is here to help you get the best out of the Oracle database and have fun with SQL. Is that an exclamation mark? Or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not SQL on. So, um, to help you with this, he blogs at All Things SQL and creates videos combining SQL and magic. Ooh, mm. the magic of SQL. Now I'm interested. Yeah. Right, so over to you. Oh, Thank thanks. You. Thanks. As you said, I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Stephen Feuerstein's Oracle Developer Advocate team. It's my job to help you get the best out of the Oracle database and hopefully have a little bit of fun, as you can see from all the chocolate over there. Um, just to um, put this in context, I work for Oracle, so all the examples and all the terminology I'm going to discuss here use Oracle database. But the principles are the same for all the major relational databases. So MySQL, SQL Server, Postgres, the fundamentals are all the same. They all use different terminology. There are subtle differences between them. I can't explain what they all are, but if you get the underlying concepts here, they will apply. You've just got to map the words and the te terminology to their system. So let's get started. So any of you spent more than about five minutes trying to tune SQL queries, you've got some slow statements, you're going, why is it so slow? And you kind of learned, okay, well, indexes are good and they make things faster. Um, but the SQL isn't using an index. It's like, why? Why on earth is it not using an index? What's going on? What am I doing wrong? Um, and the reason is it comes down to what we call the cost. We go submit the query to the database and the cost-based optimizer assigns it a cost and it's assigned the cost of not using the index is lower than the cost of using it. Now, at this point, I haven't really explained anything. I'm just trying to say it is because it is, right? Um, so what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is explain some of the factors and reasoning behind that cost. So what makes an index more expensive than a full scan and vice versa. But before we talk about something way more interesting and exciting, and that's chocolate. So um, I've got two young daughters um, and they absolutely love chocolate. And if they've been good, I will let them have some treats at the end of the day. But any of you who spent time around young children or have young children will know that they can be quite particular. So, you know, they don't just want any chocolate. No, 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 I've got, you know, they love their M&Ms, but it has to be the red ones. It can't be the blue ones, the green ones, it has to be the red ones. So at the end of the day, they come to me and say, can we have some treats? And I say, have you been good? And they go, yes. And they go, have you really been good? And, you know, they con me into convincing them to have some chocolate. Um, so I go, so do you want some red ones? And yes. So what I need to do is go through all my bags here and find all the red sweets. So what I can do is I can pick up a bunch at a time and I can open up one of the bags and see what color, see the sweets. So I can empty them out into my hand, look at the color of every single M&M, &M, see whether or not it's red. If it's red, I'll keep it. If it's not, I'll put it back in the bag. And once I've looked at all the M&Ms in this bag, I'll go on to the next bag, open that one up, repeat the process, till I've looked at all these here. Then I'll scoop up the next bag, next batch, and so on and so forth. And I'll keep doing that till I've gone through all the bags and seen whether or not every single sweep is red or not. Now, I did this a couple of times, and I thought to myself, there's got to be a, way, a better way. There's got to be a better way to find all the red M&Ms out of these bags. So what I did is I went to the shops, um, bought myself a big box of M&Ms, came home, and, and then I diligently wrote down the colour and location of every single sweet. So now, when my daughters come to me and say, can we have some red sweets? Instead of having to um, pick up the bags like this, what I can do is I can just go to my document, okay? So where's the location of the first red M&M. Okay, it's bag 42. I'll go to bag 42, open it up, get it out. Then, okay, where's the next one? Go back to my document, that's in bag 100. So I'll go to bag 100, pick it up, open it up, find it, go back to my document. So I'm continually going backwards and forwards between my document and my sweets here till I've found all the red sweets. So every time I have to go backwards and forwards. So we've got two different approaches here. One where I'm picking up several bags at once and I'm looking at every single sweet, sweet see whether or not it's red. The other, where I've got a document stating the colour and location of every single suite. So that's all very well and nice. I'm keeping my daughters happy and full of sugar. But um, what's all this got to do with databases? What's this got to do with SQL and performance? Um, now, hopefully, some of you have followed along with the analogy here. Um, so my M&Ms here are the real-world manifestation of the, a database table. So imagine we've got modelling a table here, and every m &M is a row in the table, and it's got various properties such as its colour, its weight, 
expiry ma manufacturing dates and so on. Um, and they're the columns in the table. And the document I've created was an index on that color column. So we're saying we've created an index on the color and that stores the color values and the locations of them. So those are the kind of two physical concepts we've got here. We've got our rows and we've got our indexes. But the bags themselves actually represent something kind of important. In fact, really important as well. Anyone got any idea what this is? Container? Container, not exactly. It is a container of a kind, yes. So this is something that we call an oracle, a block. Now other databases call them a page, um, but this is actually the smallest unit of data in a relational database. It's the smallest unit isn't a row, it's a block. If you want to get a block, you have to pick up, you get a row, you have to pick up the block and... Yeah, is that 1,024 bytes, 24 being the index? Um, so by default in Oracle, a block is 8K, so 8192 bytes. Well, I'm, from, I'm a pick specialist. Okay, yeah. Blocks, so 100, yeah, so different, uh, different databases have different defaults and you can specify different sizes in most of them. But you know, um, 1K, 8K, whatever it is, you can fit typically quite a few rows in each individual block or each individual page, right? So, um, and this, this is kind of a fundamental point. Every time I have to pick this up, that's an I.O. operation. And that's relatively expensive. You know, worst case, I've had to go all the way to disk. You know, disks are still cripplingly slow compared to memory. Um, even if it's in memory, I've still got to do some work. I've got to make sure no one else is accessing it at that point in time that I'm accessing it, so the data's consistent. I'm going to make sure that um, I'm getting a really consistent view of the data so everything's correct and so on. So it's a relatively expensive every time you need to access a new block. So, um, so these are kind of the base concepts we'll be working with. So then we had my two approaches. One where I was scooping up a number of bags at a time and I was opening them up and I was looking at every single suite to see whether or not it was red. So that's what we call full table scan. We're looking at the entire table. Doesn't matter if we're fetching one row from it or every single row. We still pick up every single bag, we still look at every single row to see whether or not it matches the wear clause. If it does, we pass it up to the next step. If it doesn't, we just discard it. Index range scan, on the other hand, we've got our index and we only look at the entries in the index that match our wear clause and only actually pick up the red suites. You know, we only go to the locations of those red suites and we only pick those ones up. Um, so then there is another kind of important difference between them as well. So we're looking at every, we look at every single suite for the full table scan. Using the index, we only look at the ones that are actually red. Now we might still discard them for some other reason. I might have additional um, conditions in my wear clause, say looking at expiry date or something like that. So I might still discard them, but I only access the red rows, but I still access the block. So there's another difference as well. And that is that, as you see, I was picking up a number of blocks or bags at a time when I did my full table scan. It's the same in Oracle. It can do what's called a multi-block read. It can, in one IO operation, it can scoop up at several bags or blocks. An index, on the other hand, is always picking up one at a time. So it's always going to, from your index to the next bag it finds, back to the index, and then to the next bag, and so on. So you've got this back and forth kind of going on. So these are our kind of basic working concepts. Um, so the question that we're here all here to answer is, so which one of these is going to be faster? Um, now, when I say faster, I'm not going to look at so much at wall clock time. I'm going to, what I'm asking really is which does more work? Which is going to pick up more bags? Because it's expensive, the one of those, whichever of those picks up more bags is doing more work and all other things being equal will be slower. So, this is, is test time. <laughs> Who thinks it's going to be the full scan? Who thinks that's going to be faster? To fetch? Let's imagine I've got 100 bags here and I want to find all the red ones from it. Is it going to be a full scan? No one's going for it. Who's going to go for an index? One. Some, some tends to, who's, who's hedging their bets and is waiting for me to like, yeah. You think it's both. So, um, well, let's look at what, what's going on here. So let's look at how much work we're doing. Full scan, 
we have to pick up every single bag, right? Um, but we only visit it in each one once. Once I've picked it up, I just kind of go through, go nom 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 nom, eat all the sweets. Well, I don't eat them all, I, just the red ones. Um, but I only have to pick up the bag once. But when I'm using that index, I might have had, well, you know, there's about um, 50 M&Ms per bag in six colors. I have to pick it up seven or eight times, roughly. You know, it's not exact because they're not an even distribution. So I'm actually doing up to, well, getting on for an order of magnitude more work using the index. Plus, I've got to do a little bit of work to read the index itself as well. So in terms of the work we're doing, the full table scan here is much less. So um, all other things being equal, it will be the faster approach here. Let's look at a different scenario. Let's imagine something else. Let's say Mars, who make M&Ms, do one of these kind of promotions and they have a silver suite in it and you phone it up and there's some premium rate phone number and they'll give you a year's worth supply of chocolate or whatever it is. And you, of course, you want to find that, you want the year's worth supply of chocolate. Um, so which approach is going to be faster here? We've only got 100 bags, about 1% of them are going to have a silver suite, so one, two if we're lucky maybe. Um, so which is going to be faster? So who's going to go full table scan this time? No one? Index? Yeah, everyone. So let's just, let's just remind ourselves on the work again. We still have to look at every single bag, look at every single row, see whether or not it's silver when we're doing the full scan. With our index, we just go to the document, find the location of that one, maybe two of the really lucky suites that are silver, and just pick up those one or two bags. So we'd gone from a situation where the index was doing an order of magnitude work, or an order of magnitude more work than um, the full scan, to doing an order or two magnitude less work than the full table scan. So when you submit a query to the database, um, this is what the cost-based optimizer is doing. So you send your query to the database and it's going, okay, which approach are these, which approach is going to be faster? Which is going to do less work? Now, keyword there, estimates. So there's a couple of reasons why it's an estimate. It's kind of an educated guess. One is it's working off um, database statistics. So Periodically, there's a job which will go through in your database and gather information about the table. So how many rows there are, how many blocks it uses, um, how many different values there are in the columns, what the high and low values are in those columns. And of course, as soon as that finishes, someone will come along and change some data. So basically, as soon as it's finished, it's slightly out of date. Only slightly, but over time it gets drifts and gets more and more out of date. This is why we periodically keep these stats. So you have a job to keep them up to date. Um, so it's only as good as the information from that last statistics gathering. If you put one row on the table, gathered your stats, and they did a massive data load and there's now a billion, it's, you know, it's going to be meaningless. It's essentially guessing. So it's estimating from that point of view and then it looks at the last known view of its data. Second thing is it's got to trade off speed for accuracy. So let's take a medium complicated four table join. So there's four factorial orders of ways you could join those tables. You could go A, B, C, D, you know, you could go A, B, D, C, and so on and so forth. So that's 24. Then there's three joins between them. So you always have one less join than tables you're joining because you only join two at once. And there's three different join methods. So um, Three threes, nine, so we're now up to 24 times nine, so, you know, 250 odds. Keep things simple. Imagine that there's just an index, one index available, so there's only two choices, index versus full scan. 500 possible ways it could combine those tables and access them to produce, to actually run the query. Um, so that's already a fairly large number, and you see, as you add more and more tables and more and more indexes and more and more possibilities, that just exponentially grows and grows. And it's quite quickly possible to end up in a situation where you've got thousands and thousands of possibilities. And of course, when you've got that many, at some point, some inaccuracies are going to arise. Some, there's some heuristics which will come in and mean that it might find a, um, an approach which is not as good as one which may be available because it takes some shortcuts. So it's estimating these calculations. So at this point, um, any questions actually or comments before I move on? 
So, yeah. The more, the more, the, the more times you've got the data in a table, the less, the less helpful the index is. The, the more rows with the same value, you mean? Yeah, the more rows that have the same value... The less, the less helpful it is. The less helpful the index will be. More distributed, so. Well, so let's, uh, let's have a look at this little demo, just to kind of... So hopefully this will help. Um, any other questions or comments before we move on? No? Cool. All right, so I've got my table here. Hopefully that's just about visible. So you can see I've modelled... We've got our standard six colours, which is just over 900 of, and silver, which there is only one of. Um, so I'm going to do what we call an explain. Uh, how familiar people with explain with execution plans and? Okay, yeah. Okay, so basically, what this is, um, it's a breakdown of all the operations that the database undertakes to run the query. Um, so if we look here, we can see. What we're saying, we've got this table and we're fully scanning it, so we're not using an index, we're reading every single row. Um, and we've got this column over here that's cardinality. So that's its guess of how many rows this operation will turn, how many rows you're going to get. Now, there are five and a half thousand rows in the table, um, you can do the maths if you don't believe me. Um, so it's bang on and that's accurate. And then there's this kind of magical cost figure I was mentioning. So that's when it um, basically it considers all the, well, a number of possibilities. We've got one table here, we've got an index, and we've got full scan, and it's going, what's the cost of the index? What's the cost of the full scan? I will choose the approach that has the lower cost. Um, that cost number is a normalized figure, which has no bearing outside of this query. So if you've got two separate queries, and one of them has a cost of 50, and another has a cost of 50,000, it doesn't mean that second query is going to be ten, well, um, a thousand times slower than the first one. It just means that um, in terms of how it's estimated the work it's going to do, that's the figure it's going to come up with. Um, so you can't directly, you know, if you've got completely different queries, you can't directly compare these. But let's just bear with it for a moment and let me just get out of there. So you can see it's got cost of 13 to full scan the table. And I'm going to just pin that for a second. So we're going to get all the red ones. We can see we've got cardinalities come down to 916. So it's got that bang on exactly how many red rows there are. Cost is stayed the same. We still have to look at every single block. We still have to look at every single row. Still doing the same amount of work. And then um, when we get just our one row, we can see the cardinality comes down to one and it still has the same cost. So always doing the same amount of work to full scan the row, doesn't matter how many rows we're going to get. Let's see what happens when we use the index. Um, so we have our index, so we've got our query to find the ones with silver here, and we can, you can see that basically we're saying, first, you, you've got to kind of work from the, the bottom and work to the top when reading these plans. So the first thing it's doing is accessing the index to find those where the color is silver, and then it goes to the table for those rows. So like I had my document, I only found the location of that red suite, went to actually pick it up and go back. Essentially, that's what we're saying here. Um, and we can see cardinality of one, so it's estimated exactly how many rows there's going to be, and it's given it cost of two, so nice and low. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Just get out of that. So if we now um, force it to use the index to, when getting the red suites, you can see the cost has gone up to 40. So the full table scan had a cost of 13 for red, 40 um, if we use the index. Fetching more rows using the index, cost goes up, the database isn't going to use it. And of course we can fetch all the rows via the index where we start at the top of the index and just keep going backwards and forwards between the index for every single entry. You can do that as well and the cost goes Oh, you know, an order of magnitude again, more or less. So 230 odd. Um, so, but what I've shown so far are explained plans. They are just a prediction. They're essentially a guess about what the database thinks it might do when it comes to running your query. So, you know, if you're, like, you're planning a long journey and you put it in your sat nav and it gives you a predicted route. Now, you, you might follow that route, you probably follow it, but you might change your mind. You might start driving and go, I don't want to go that way, there's been a crash, I'll go a different route. 
So this is a guess about what it might do when it comes to running your query. Um, and there's lots of reasons why that guess can be wrong. Obviously, between me running this and then uh, producing this prediction, actually running the query, the data might change, there might be some other differences. Um, but there's some more kind of fundamental problems. So what I've got here is a variable. So I don't know, we don't know which color we're looking for. Um, and if we do this and we produce our prediction, we get this cardinality here of 786. Where does that figure, what, what, where does that figure come from? Has anyone got any idea? An average then of all the different. Yes. Yeah. So if we go and say, we have seven different colors and we've got five and a half thousand rows. Five and a half thousand divided by seven is 786. Um, essentially, it's hedged its bets, it's guessed. It goes, well, I don't know what this value is, so I'll just take the middle of the road, what I can do. Um, and this is just a fairly simple um, example. You imagine you've got you know, two or three of these with guesses. These errors compound. Um, and can it lead to wild plans that have no bearing on what actually is going to happen when it comes to actually running the query. So what you really want to see is the information about actually executing your query and what actually happens when you do that. Um, so we can do that. And so, so far we've been looking at what are called explain plans. The real plans are what we call execution plans. They sound annoyingly similar. It's very easy to get confused. Um, but the key thing is, let me just, um, put silver in. The execution plan has a lot more detail. So like you, you put your route into your sat nav and it tells you what it, how fast you think you might go when you're taking your journey. Um, or you can actually record, you know, you can get some things which record you, how you're traveling GPS track you and tell you how fast you actually traveled on all the roads and how long it actually took you. It's the same principle here. The execution plan is telling you what's actually going on. So you can see we've got a whole bunch of extra information here. Um, one of the, oh, let's give me the slightly the wrong one here. Let's give me, there we go. Um, one of the things that is, key things it gives you is it tells you how much work each step actually did, did and how many rows it processed. So you can see we're getting one, our silver row, it's outputting one and it gets one. It's good, right? Um, if you're in a situation, one of the key things you want to look for is figuring out whether it got the right plan, took the right route, is are those estimates close to the actuals? You know, if they're within an order of magnitude, so you know, if one's five and a half thousand and the other's um, six thousand, that's close enough, it's probably okay. But if we've got one here and the other says five and a half thousand, they are way out, it's a good chance that there's a better plan available. There's a better route that you can, the database can take to execute that query. With one slight little wrinkle to that, so what you do, you take this estimated cardinality, multiply it by how many times this operation actually ran, these last starts, and then check if that equals your last output rows. Um, so that's a good in guideline of whether or not this is the right plan. Is this the right way to execute this query? Next thing is useful to see is Elapsed time, so this is microseconds, how long did it actually take to do this, and um, buffer gets. Um, so that's basically our I.O. operations, picking up these blocks and doing the work there. So you can see here, it took three, to actually completely where it took three. So both these time and get figures are cumulative of everything underneath them. So if I scroll across this way a bit, we see we've got, we started at bottom at the bottom with our index, which has two. Our table end access has three, but what you actually need to do is subtract one from that. Subtract three from two. So we only did one unit, you know, one bit of work to actually do the gets there. Um, again, for the, the elapsed time, it was 35 microseconds to read the index and another uh, 23 to actually access the table. Okay. Um, so that's the plan we've got for Silver. We access, um, did use the index. What's going to happen if I put red in? What's the database going to do now? What, what do we want it to do now? Do we want it to use the index or the full table scan? We, we want it to use the full table scan, right? Let's see what happens. So we run that. 
use the index. You can see last output rows 916 versus one, probably not the right plan. And this is something that used to be a really big problem in Oracle database way back in the dark ages. Um, so the first time you run a query, it'll do what's called a little peek. It'll look at these values here and then come up with an appropriate plan. But if the first time you run that query, either the first time you deploy a new application or you've just restarted your database, and it um, happens to be an unusual or unpopular value, then you can end up with a plan which is not very good for the rest of your queries. Um, and this was, there's very, lots of hacky ways around it, or lots of hacky ways around it, but essentially you could be quite stuck. Um, fortunately, well, quite some time ago now, we addressed this. Um, if we run this query again with red, oh, what's not going to do it now? There we go. It switched to the full table scan. Um, it's able to identify that um, they, there was, it got the plan wrong, or it, what it estimated was way out from what actually happened. Key thing to note here, it does have to get it wrong at least once before it will get it right. Um, but unlike in the past where if someone, some unusual person came in and picked, looked for the silver sweep first thing in the morning, everyone else would be, have slow searches for the rest of the day. Now it's just the second person who will have the search. And after that, everyone else should have um, good performance. Any questions on this before I move on? Is that, is that only something that happens in Oracle? Is it, or, does, or do other ones also? So to be honest, I don't know. This has, that technology has been in Oracle for 10 years now. So it's probably in other places. I would be surprised if I don't know, it doesn't exist in some form in the other databases. That doesn't mean it is. Okay. I mean, something like SQLite probably doesn't, um, but SQL Server, Postgres, I'd be very surprised if they didn't. But I, I don't know enough about them to comment. <laughs> You'll have to check. Yeah. Okay, um, so everyone kind of happy so far, right? And everything I've discussed so far, I made a colossal assumption. Does anyone know what it is. No? What you're searching for is smaller than the block size, or page size. What's that, sorry? What you're searching for is smaller than a block size. Uh, the rows, you mean, are slower than an individual block? Smaller. Yeah. Um, that's true, I have made that assumption. Um, and, yeah, I guess if the rows themselves, well, uh, yeah, that gets, a bit, that gets a bit advanced and complicated. Um, but that's not quite what I was thinking of. That it, that it is something we could perhaps talk, check out that later if we want to. Is the assumption that you will ask for this question over and over? Just do this search over and over? Um, yeah, I guess I have, but that's not kind of what I'm thinking. I'm, I'm, okay, so I made an assumption about how the data is stored in the table here versus how it's written in the index or written in the document. Modeled up, not in order. I've assumed that there is absolutely no correlation between how the entries are written in that document versus how they are stored in the table. Let's make a different assumption. Yeah. Let's imagine that Mars decided to change their bagging process um, and that in fact all you only get one color in each bag, right? Um, so if we imagine here I've got all my hundred bags again, well how does that change things? Well, very significantly, actually, because now, if I'm just looking for the red ones, I no longer need to visit every single bag. I only need to visit the 16 or so, you know, the one in six, that actually have the red sweets. Um, and let's make, go even further with that assumption. Let's imagine the order that they're listed in the index exactly matches the order they are in that table. So all the red ones, so we, if we get to the red entry, so that starts at bag 20, this is bag 20, and all these red ones are all next to each other in that index. Well, exactly. So I can just pick this up, and I can just go, nom, 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 eating the sweets out of it. I don't need to keep, I still need to go back and forth between my index and my block, but I don't need to do all the work to acquire it, make sure no one else is accessing it, and so on. I can pin it in my hand. So, if you look at the red list on the first slide, 
and you had um, some of the numbers, like tw there was two bags with 21 that were together, two bags with 83 together, and I scanned down to see if they were grouped together. Right, so... But I only did it on the red ones and then assumed that they were all... But they weren't in numerical order. Yeah, so I did, I did mislead you a little bit at the start, just to help kind of make a point. <laughs> Indexes are ordered data structures. So when you add an entry into it, things have to go in the correct location. And that location is determined by the values you're indexing, so the colour. So it has to be sorted alphabetically. And then um, the location of that row. And the block makes up part of that location. So all the red rows in the same block will be right next to each other. So actually, really what you get in reality is something a bit more like this. The first, the red entries in bag one would all be here, then I could read those. Then I can move on to bag two. Um, now, no, oh, excuse me. Um, now, you might think that actually this means that the index is now more efficient than the full scan. A couple of things to remember. You still need to read that index. You're still doing some work actually accessing that. Um, and so, and you doing single block accesses versus picking up several at once. Now, later versions of Oracle have changed that slightly, so it is a bit better than that. Um, but fundamentally, if you still have to access every single block using an index, it's still almost always going to be slower than doing a full scan, because you've got to access the index itself as well. So this is a really fundamental concept, and it's what we call in Oracle the clustering factor. Um, I believe Postgres call it the fill factor or something like that, or the databases have slightly different terms for it. Um, but essentially, this is a measure of how well that logical order of the index matches the physical order of the data in the table. Um, and in Oracle, at least, it's a um, numeric value that starts with a lower bound of the number of blocks in the table, which goes up to the number of rows in the table. So essentially, it's a counter. When it gathers the stats, what it does is it walks down that index. And it finds, so it starts with the blue one, looks in bag one, and then, OK, that's in bag one. And then it goes, where's the next blue one? Where's the next entry? Is it in the same bag? If it is, it doesn't increment the counter. If it isn't, it increments the counter. So every time consecutive entries are in a different physical location, it increments that counter. So the number goes up and up. And the higher that is, the less effective the index will be. So if we take a look here, imagine these are our blocks across here, and each of these represents a row. All the rows we're interested in are right next to each other. So we've got a clustering factor of 10. That's good where alternatively they could be scattered, scattered throughout the table. Bad, 120. Um, so at this point, a lot of people um, go, well, okay, Chris, you said it makes a difference, but does it really make that much difference? You can't make that much of a difference, can it? So um, I'll have, an have another quick demo. So we've got our table here, and you can see we've got various columns on it. So you know, we've got color, weight, whether it's peanut or chocolate, and just some um, insert dates and so on. So if we query this, we can see that for the insert date and sequence primary key, so an incrementing, these are perfectly clustered values. So that clustering factor is just 36. Um, that means every single row is nice sequentially ordered. We start at row one here, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to row five and a half thousand over here. The weights, on the other hand, are basically completely random. So our clustering factor is 400 and whatever it is, 4,000 whatever it is. And the color is somewhere in between. Um, if you're wondering where that 217, anyone able to guess where that 217 comes from? So we've got six colors. Six times 36 is 216. <laughs> um, so we have our six regular colors, which are in every single block. And our silver one, which happens to be in just one block. So 636 is 216 plus one gives us that. So we've had to scan through the whole table six times and then find our silver entry. Anyway, so let's see how big an impact that has. So I'll we'll look at our, um, find our sweeps between these weights. And you can see here we're getting uh, 548 rows. So about 10% of the table. And we've got, uh, gone for a full scan. Now, if I, yeah, just pin that. 
Let's fetch another 10% of the rows to the table, but this time we're gonna use that nicely, perfectly clustered ID. Run that, and we see, we still have, we actually get slightly more rows, two more, but we use an index. And in terms of gets, 11 versus 41. We've done less work to fetch data from the same table, to fetch actually slightly more rows from the same table. And it's all to do with how that logical order matches that physical order of the data. So the more closely they are, the more effective the index is gonna be, the more likely the database is to use it. And we can see, we can actually go, we can just verify further. So we've got our weights, um, fetch them again, force it to use an index. In terms of the work it does, 500, 458, sorry. Um, there was only 36 odd blocks in the table. So we must have had to go backwards and forwards and revisit the same bag multiple times. So we have to pick it up, revisit it, reaccess it. Uh, whereas, uh, and actually we can see, we can go down to as little as 39 rows, so less than 1% of the values of the table, and only then does it can be, become marginally more efficient to use the index than it is the full scan. Whereas that perfectly clustered ID, we can get 1,250 rows over 20% of the table. So, and it does 25 IO operations, um, over 25% of the table, and it's still more efficient than a full scan. So how this physical order matches that logical order is massive, really massive. Um, any questions on this before we move on? Mm, no, yes? Okay. Um, so no one, no one asked the obvious question. How do you improve the clustering factor? You know, go on. I've got one question. This um, cost, yeah. um, you know, obviously this is a process running in the background before you actually do the actual search. So has that got an overhead? Um, so the first time you submit a query to the database, it has to figure out all this, and that's where it assigns the cost. So that's an overhead on the search that if either way you, you've got an overhead on it, but going forward that overhead is taken, is factored in then? Yeah, so it does that work the very first time you submit it to the database. Yeah. So you write a new query, it's got to do the work to figure out all this stuff. Yeah. Subsequent times, it doesn't have to do that. As long as that query is still in the database cache, so it only keep caches them for a certain period of time. So it's a least recently used algorithm. So if you submit a thousand, well, let's say a hundred thousand different queries, chances are that first one you ran is no longer in the cache and it's going to get going to be pushed out. Um, whereas if you execute one query a hundred thousand times, that's definitely going to be in the cache. It's going to stay there. Um, so you know, in a typical application you want to be executing a, a relatively small set of queries over and over and over again, and they'll all stay cached. But for like reporting data warehouses and data analysis, you're going, okay, well, how much did we sell yesterday? Um, who was the highest valued customer yesterday? Yeah, running a different query each time, potentially. So you've got that overhead. And like I say, that overhead is pretty small unless your com query's really complicated. Um, that's what we were saying about trading off speed versus of accuracy. Yeah. Um, the more complicated that query becomes, the slower that process gets, but we try and keep that as small as possible. So there might be times where it, um, it just kind of cuts off processing and has a better approach available, but it hasn't had time to find that. That's when you do cascading SQLs. Cascading SQLs? I'm not familiar with that term. Well, you know, instead of doing the search with your whole criteria, you search and bring back a selection, and then you search on that selection. Oh, okay. It's smaller, and it's, that's more efficient. Um, it depends. It's, it's, a, it's a complex thing, but basically, um, unless your query is really, really complicated, you probably don't need to worry about this. However, when you're writing an application, the key thing to... Uh, actually, if I just pop back, I'm going to for time. Yeah, we're right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, no, no, it's fine. Um, so, here I've used what's called a bind variable. So what happens is it knows that um, it's the same query every time I submit that to the database. Now I could write it slightly differently. I could kind of um, quote it. it I could uh, do string concatenation. I could build up a string 
and pass it up so that I'm actually passing that, the query becomes that. Um, now, six different values, that doesn't matter too much, but if I'm searching by ID, you know, five and a half thousand IDs, people are always searching by a different one, that's a different query each time. Um, and then you potentially do run into that overhead because it, it literally, it looks at that text and it basically it hashes that and says, does this text exist in my previously run plans? If it does, it, it uses that. If it doesn't, then it has to go through all that work of uh, figuring out the plan. And they also do other stuff like, you know, a syntax check. Is your query valid? Have you got the permissions to run it? Blah, 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 blah. Do these objects really exist? Are these tables in your database? That kind of thing. Um, so, does that answer your question? Sure, let me just, all right, then. let's. So, how do we improve the clustering factor? Um, how do you get it so that the data is nicely clustered? So, all the rows you're interested in are right next to each other in the table. Um, so, in Oracle database, something to be aware of, all, by default, all the tables are what we call heap organized. This means that the database is free to stick the rows wherever they're spaced. So just like if you drop a grain of sand on the top here, it's probably gonna go on the top, but you know, it might roll down the side, it can end up anywhere it wants. If you're gonna add a new row to a table, it's probably gonna go like at the end of the table, you know, but it could go anywhere. If I take a bag out the middle, eat half the contents, I've now filled up half a ba uh, left room of half, for half a bag, so new rows could end up in the middle of the table rather than at the end. Um, so by default, they're heap organized. So you have no control over where those rows go. Fortunately, there are a whole bunch of data structures you can use to force a particular order. Um, and um, in Oracle database, so one of those is what we call an index organized table. So normally you've got your, in, your table, you've got your primary key index, they're separate data structures. This combines them into one, so the table is effectively an index. Um, now this is where Oracle differs substantially to SQL Server. SQL Server, this is effectively the default. They have their clustered um, index tables. That's their default in SQL Server. Heap is the option you have to choose. Oracle, you get the heap by default. Yeah, clustered index is what you um, have to choose, or uh, index organized table. Um, no, in Oracle, this has to be by primary key. So the values have to be unique. It's not gonna work so well with our color here, is it? With all the rows, are, those values aren't unique. Now you can do cheaty things, like um, stick the real primary key on the end of, you know, take the color and stick the real primary key on the end. I wouldn't really do that unless you're really sure about what you're trying to do and you know what you're, uh, what you're getting at, but um, it is plausible. What actually we want to do here, really, we want to find all the rows for a particular color. So what we can do is partition it. And what partitioning does is you say, we're going to sort the data by this color and effectively split it up into separate subtables. So we partition it by color. We can say effectively, you know, we've got all the um, yellow ones here, all the red ones here, all the orange ones here, and so on. So now, when we say, look for the red ones, we go to the red, the red subtable, and all those rows here are red. So, you know, we're guaranteed that everything we're looking for is roughly in the same location. So that's probably more likely what we're gonna look for here. Um, there's also something called table clusters in Oracle database. This is more about if you've got separate tables and you want to be in the same location. So, you know, I'm concerned about my daughter's health. I want them to be eating some fruit as well as stuffing their face with sugar. So what I want to do is I get my fruit table and I want the red fruits to be right next to the red chocolate. So, you know, like the strawberries and the raspberries and, you know, so when they get the red sweets, they also happen to get some red fruit and hopefully they eat it. It doesn't work, they don't fall for it, but you know, hopefully that's my plan. But the idea is then that this bag no longer contains just red M&Ms, it also contains um, fruit that happens to be red, such as cherries or strawberries or whatever. It's an advanced feature, lots of gotchas with using it, read up carefully before going ahead and using it, just it's useful to be aware of. Um, so, another thing to be aware of here is you can only sort things by one column or one set of attributes, right? I can sort it by color, 
But I can't then also sort it, well, it, it, if I sort it by color, it's then disordered by other attributes. So by improving the clustering factor for my color, I'm possibly also making it worse by weight, right? Um, now, this may not be a problem for you. You know, you, know, you want to sort your data by a particular, um, whatever your dominant query is. You might say in your application, so my application here is, I want searches by color to be really, really fast because I know my daughter's going to ask for a particular color and I want to give them that as fast as possible. But, you know, we don't think about it, but chocolate does have an expiry date. It's usually so far in the future and we eat it so quick, we never hit it. But, you know, I'm, I, I don't want my daughter to be eating stuff that's gone off or is about to go off. So once a week, I have a query that says, find me everything that's going to expire or has expired within the next seven days. So I can prioritize feeding those. I don't care how long that takes to run. That can take, you know, I can schedule it on Sunday night, can take several hours. I don't care of it, how long it takes, as long as it's done and I've got the email on Monday morning. So you've got to know, this is where you've got to know what your requirements are, what your data is, what your dominant queries are. Um, and it's, you, you're always going to have to make trade-offs here, or usually will. Um, there's no straightforward answers. Any questions before we finish up? Think, was this useful? Make sense? Cool. All right then, so I'm just going to wrap up. So as we see, full scan, always looks at every single row, accesses every single block, does the same amount of work whether you fetch one row or every single row. The index does an increasing amount of work the more rows you fetch from the table. But the cutover point of when that's more work than the full scan entirely depends on the physical order of the data and how well it matches that logical order that the index imposes on it. So quite often when optimizing queries or when people start learning about SQL tuning, one of the first things they start to ask is, how many rows does this, do we get from this table? So, you know, is it turning one row, two row, and so on, to decide whether or not it's using an index. Um, and I contend that actually, that's not really that useful a thing to know. I mean, okay, if you're fetching one row, you want to use an index, pretty much always. If you've got like a top end, you know, you want to do top 10 rows for your kind of search results, again, you probably want to use an index, almost always. But what if you're fetching 100 rows from a table? 1,000, 10,000. Should you use an index? Should you use a full table scan? Well, I don't know. It's not really that useful to think about rows. What you really need to think about is how many blocks or pages, IO operations you're doing using that index versus how many blocks there is in the entire table. Um, Unfortunately, there isn't really a good way to know this other than running your query. You have to run the fit query to find out how much work it actually does. And of course, um, could just be, let's say, um, Mars make do some, I think they've got like white ones. No, it's Skittles who have the white ones at the moment, don't they? So you've got your normal different colored ones, and then you've got a whole batch of white ones, which are nicely perfectly clustered. So you could even have sub-clustering of your data within one table by the same column. Um, there isn't really an easy answer to this, but things like the clustering factor are a proxy which will help you understand it. If you really need performance to be really good for a particular query on particular columns, look at those data structures which enforce a particular order, order on it. So thank you all for joining me. I'm Chris Saxon. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Help yourself to chocolate. <laughs> Do we need to brush so, off or? Uh, we, have, um, we have eight minutes okay. until we need to be in track one here in the uh, finale, if you like. So, any questions? No? Why yeah? have got an index with multiple uh, columns in it? Then basically, it, um, so there's a couple of things that can happen there. Let's imagine we've got um, an index on color and expiry date. So if my where clause includes both color and expiry date, we find those entries in the index that match those and we only access those rows. If I um, only search by color, then in effect, the fact that we've got expiry date is irrelevant. It still finds the location of those red rows and we can use it or not use it as appropriate. If 
So we've got color first and then expiry date. Um, basically, the index is a tree, and it sorts all the data first by the first column. Then it sorts by whatever the second column in the index is, and the third or whatever. If you search by whatever the second column in that index is, it's very unlikely to use it because essentially it has to kind of like, yeah, it, there are some edge cases where it can, but generally speaking, it won't. Okay. Um, uh, so it's something to be aware of. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah. So there's another question, was that Theo down? Go on. It's really not the right place to say this, but when you were talking about all the clustering there at the end, I just started thinking no SQL. No SQL, in what sense? Like what, you, what you're trying to do there is you're trying to access the data in different ways, mm -hmm. different views, depending yeah. on your application. Your application wants to see that data organised differently, and mm -hmm. you start to talk about how the sub tables mm -hmm. are made. Mm -hmm. So called subtables from those things. That just makes me think you know, screw up because in SQL you are gonna just do that yourself in make everything third create the data how you want it to be. Yeah. So that's normalization, isn't it? Well, or not normalization is the case. So you're let's right. say you, you're searching for orders by customer ID. Um, and so you build your orders or by order ID. So you've got all the information for the order and it's all in that JSON blob or whatever it is. And you always search by ID. So that's all right in the same location. So what happens now when you want to search by customer ID? Okay. So well, are, you, are, you gonna, are you gonna duplicate every copy yeah. of your data in a different access? Yeah. Really? How do you keep them all in sync? Yeah, that's the problem, but yeah. You know, um, I you, just put that forward as something that just was going off in my head as you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to do it, if you're prepared, to, if you're happy to take the work of maintaining all those cross references, because of course, um, let's say the customer decides to delete all their orders or something. Okay, you search by I, customer ID and delete all those orders, but then you've still got to scan through your order representation of that table, look through all, all of them to find they, the customer ID. This is like when the, when the, the person wants to come in and query, it's faster. It, it might take a lot of work to produce that on write and the people that wouldn't sync. Well, it's yeah, nice. but it's... it's bit, especially like things like in memory stuff. In memory is a bit different. I use cross-referencing quite, yes. you know, I, I, I do that cross-referencing and I think it sometimes, if you're doing, you know, if you don't know what the user wants, mm. but if you know the user's going to mm. want that information, just those jobs, yeah. you know, there's only 10, then it, you know to take the time to write those into a, an in, you know cross reference index yeah. it pays dividends. Yeah, if you know that your data is only ever going to be accessed in a particular way, that can make sense. Part of the reason for storing in the table and row data is that it's generic access, in the sense that you don't know what your requirements are going to be tomorrow. You don't want to have to rewrite. You, you know the the customer comes along. Actually, there's there's a Quite a good story. Someone who did a NoSQL database for they tried to build their own IMDb clone, and basically they did it in NoSQL um, organized by film, and that was fine. Everything worked. And then someone said, "Well, we want to search by actor." Oh, yeah, and now, the, and what what would have been no work at all for a relational database was like months of work for them to have to rebuild all that data. So, you know. Basically, you know, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's the trade-off. With this, you're more flexible, and you can you don't need to do any real extra work. Maybe add an index, write whatever screen it is, versus having to reorganize your whole data to support a new query. I just want to annoy you. <laughs> <laughs> no chocolate for you. <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Um, feel free to take some chocolate.